uh, whoop, got it. Uh, animation going along here just so you can see it uh, as things move around and this is you know you can see the year uh, so this is the reason why I like studying the solar system is because things evolve on human time scales and you can go to a telescope and take a picture of a Kuiper belt object and a few minutes later it's moved I love that that's that's really what I'm looking for um, I also really like this animation because it shows you the the, the structure of the belt and how far out it goes. They, they really, these things move out to hundreds and thousands of astronomical units, and we only see the ones that happen to get closest to us. Um, and so there's the context of where we sit within uh, the Kuiper belt. Um, these are the two objects that we recently flew by. Pluto, of course, not a, not a planet anymore, so sad. <laughs> and um, Erikov, the red snowman. Um, uh, if you ask me what the Kuiper belt looked like uh, or what these objects would look like before New Horizons flew by them, I would never have guessed anything quite like this, that's for sure. Um, and we're, the, my, my research is trying to understand how these things form. Um, and so it's a very, you know, what you're seeing on the left and the right are two very different scales of Kuiper belt object. Pluto, of course, is a couple thousand kilometers across, and Erikoth from head to foot is only about 60 kilometers across. And so very, very different scales. Uh, now we expect that Pluto is made of a whole bunch of the Erikoth type objects, um, but the process, how you go from dust to Erikoth and then from Erikoth to Pluto, if in fact that is the order, uh, is something I've been, I've dedicated my career to trying to understand. And so the JWST program that I'm gonna be running is aimed to provide us some information that we can use to gauge the simulations that myself and other colleagues will run on how these things actually grow up. Um, and so those are the two objects uh, that we just pointed out there, Pluto being the, the one on the right and Erikoth being the one on the left. Um, and if I drew New Horizons, the, the trajectory on here would actually be basically a straight line between those two. And that's why we're able to go from one to the next. Um, so as I say, the goal is to understand uh, sort of planet growth, um, or more correctly, the first stages of planet growth, because of course, even Pluto, as large as it is, didn't quite get up to uh, planethood. Um, the old fashioned way of uh, how we thought about how these things grow is what I call hierarchical growth, where we start from small things and they bump or stick together and they form bigger things that bump and stick together to form ever bigger things and so on and so forth until that process is complete and a planet forms on the right side. Um, we've all actually seen this before uh, because we've been on, I don't know why that's no longer centered, sorry, but uh, we've been on, uh, can I move it? Nope, I can't move it. All right. That's supposed to be a picture of uh, a car. Uh, it is a picture of a car uh, collecting bugs on the dashboard. And so this is the best analogy I've come up with for how hierarchical growth actually works. Uh, big things collecting small things, essentially. Um, but there's a new theory, a uh, new kid on the block uh, I, that has actually very quickly gained favor and it's called uh, gravitational collapse. Um, and it's, it's not so intuitive. So let me walk you through it. Um, what you're looking at here is a simulation of uh, gas and dust, which you'll see in a sec when I started. I want to give you a little context before I get this thing going. The sun is to the left, and this is a, a box of material that is in orbit in a disk around the sun. And uh, the reason why we're, that what we've done here is we've actually just sort of taken that box and we move it along in the disk and look at what the material does inside the box. And so this is a technique of simulation that allows us to simulate a small section of the disk without actually uh, doing the whole thing. So it's much easier on our computers. And I'll get this going here. Um, and so the reason why it looks like it's twisty like that is because the stuff that's closer to the sun is orbiting a little bit faster and the stuff that's away from the sun is orbiting a little slower. And so in this box, there is an effective shear that, that occurs. Um, and what you're seeing here are these bright spots are density enhancements in the shearing. And what's causing that is the interaction between uh, dust, and I mean dust like the stuff that you have uh, uh, growing on an old TV or collecting on your, you know, your desk, um, all the way up to pebbles and the gas itself. Um, and what's actually happening here, the, the clumping is, is driven by a thing called, we call a streaming instability. And so if you're a cyclist, you've, you've actually taken advantage of this before in a, in a peloton, um, where a group of cyclists will form a little wedge and the person at the front, the, the chump at the front is the one that's doing all the work because everyone behind them has a little bit of the air pushed out of the way. And so they can go just as fast with a little bit less effort. 
And so exactly the same thing happens here where you have a, a, a pebble or a particle in the front leading a group of pebbles behind it that experiences all the gas drag. And so those other pebbles catch up and they clump together. And that's what you get uh, actually pretty quickly in, in these simulations. So this simulation spans a couple hundred years to give a, some context. And then once we uh, let the simulation run to sort of completion or like, you know, a late stage like what we see here, we will take one of these clumps, one of those red densities and simulate what the pebbles do. And so that's this next simulation here. And so now, uh, unfortunately, I've, I've turned everything on its side. Uh, these are the simulations that myself and one of my uh, former PhD students have run. Uh, the sun is on the bottom. So the shear on the left box is left to right. And what you see in those boxes are pebbles. So these, these are actually objects that are centimeter to meter scale things, but they have the same physics as the stuff that I was showing you previously. And on the right is what I call the vomit cam. It is the zoom in on the most massive thing that exists at whatever instant in the simulation. So let's get this moving here. So there's that shear I'm talking about. And this cloud of pebbles under its own gravity very quickly collapses. Um, you can see the time on the top here. This is written in seconds because this is what we phys physicists and astronomers use, but that's basically measured in you know human years. It, it takes less than an orbit of the sun for this collapse process to go mainly to completion. Um, and what we're showing on the left here, these two particles that are now in orbit around each other are actually about 70 kilometers in diameter in this particular simulation. Uh, the, the sizes of the particles reflect the mass, not, not the actual size in, in reality, uh, but you take it for what it is. And so this is what we actually get as a sort of proto uh, Arakoff. Um, eventually, as time goes on and the rest of the particles disperse, you're left with these two things that are relatively close together and gravitationally bound. And then tides, the same thing that lifts up the, the oceans as the moon orbits, uh, we'll draw these two things together and stick them together into the Arakoth size bodies we see. Um, and now this is the beauty of this simulation is it's really quite untuned. Um, we basically just took the output of what naturally occurs in the streaming instability that previous animation I showed you and asked the question, what falls out the other side? And amazingly, the right mass scale, the right size scale, the right orbits, the right everything just kind of naturally works. And so this is the reason why we think something like this might be going on. Uh, it's still pretty early days. We've only been studying this for about a decade. So we have a lot of work to do where hierarchical growth has been studied for 300 years. So, you know, we've still got a lot of work to do. Um, and so that leads me into the JWST program is we want to know what sort of planet growth history would allow you to have only two Plutos in the Kuiper Belt and about 10,000 or 100,000 Arakoths, you know, that, that sort of thing. Um, and so, uh, the way we would look at this in a sort of a scientific perspective is we look at the, uh, well, I'm an observer, so I don't, I don't look at diameters, I look at brightnesses, and I use brightness to infer diameter. And so on the bottom here, I'm plotting um, apparent magnitude. And so the Kuiper Belt objects that I typically look at are between 20 and 28th magnitude. Um, and those correspond to diameters between, say, 5 and 300 kilometers. Pluto, for reference, is, is 2,000 kilometers and a 19th magnitude source. Um, and then what I'm plotting here is the size distribution in log space, because in, in the logarithm of the number, uh, it, it's just a little bit easier to look at because there's always way, way, way more small things than big things. And so by taking the log, we can put everything on the same plot. And this is a bit of a, a, a storytelling exercise because we don't yet know uh, what the, the number of objects at 28th to 30th magnitude is but that's what we're gonna get with JWST. And so these three separate lines here, uh, the, the orange, blue, and green are three different realizations of different sort of formation routes and what we might expect to see when we go off and observe these things. Uh, for reference, the purple line there, that dashed vertical thing is the size that HST was able to achieve in the deepest ever moving object survey ever done. Um, and that got us to about 10 kilometers in diameter. So like Arakoth was found as one of these surveys. Um, the, put, to put it in reference, what we expect to get out of our upcoming JWST survey is the red line there, whole magnitude and a half fainter and down to about five, maybe seven kilometers in diameter. Um, 
And so it's going to be amazing. It's actually a very short survey in terms of amount of time spent. And that just shows you the power of uh, JWST. Uh, we're going to be using near cam. That is that camera there being pulled out of its shipping crate, basically. Um, I thought that's just a fantastic picture because this is what it looks like in a lab. Um, and there is the pointing history. I'm not going to not going to bore you with all of that sort of stuff. Um, one of the things that I do want to point out, though, is how we're going to do this. Uh, and so this is where I my my expertise helps the program. Um, the top three pictures are uh, three consecutive images separated by about an hour of a Kuiper Belt object to help discover uh, for the New Horizons project. And believe it or not, there is actually a Kuiper Belt object in there, though you can't really see it. Um, and that's just because these things are so very faint and moving, we can't just take a picture. We can't just stare for a few hours and see something because it all trails out. So instead, what we do is we take exposures that are a few minutes long and we take 100 of them or some number like that, and then we digitally shift and stack them afterwards. And if we use the right trajectory in the shift and stack, you get the motion, you count, account for the motion of the object and you put all of the light onto the same pixels. And so that same object in the top stands out very clearly in the bottom when you get the right rate. And so this is measured in arc seconds per hour. So you, you can see that Kuiper Belt objects actually do move in real time. And so that's what we're going to be doing with the JWST. Uh, by the way, there is the source, whether you believe it or not. <laughs> um, the amazing thing is we were blown away and extremely lucky on this one. We will also be observing the same field at the same time with the HST, uh, Hubble. Um, and this is going to be a first for us. We're actually going to measure uh, parallaxes to the discovered objects because the uh, JWST is, of course, in orbit around the sun behind the Earth, and HST is in orbit around the Earth. And so we'll get this sort of three-dimensional orbital map of every one of our objects almost immediately, which has never been done before. And I don't even know what the data is going to look like. I'm very, very excited about it. Um, but the idea is we're basically just going to go discover something like 30 or 40 Kuiper Belt objects and measure their brightnesses, infer their sizes, and use that as the lever arm to tell us which version of these two growth modes may have happened. Um, I went through that pretty quickly. Uh, I don't know, maybe now is a good chance to, to ask questions. What do you think, Maddie? Go now? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think questions now before we okay. move on to a completely different topic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so is there anyone in the crowd that uh, wants to ask anything? I won't be offended if the answer is no. <laughs> All right. Addy, why don't you go uh, take it away there? All righty. So, so I literally study the opposite end of the universe to Wes, <laughs> about as far from each other as we could possibly get. Um, so I study the very first supermassive black holes in the universe. So to start, I'm hoping this video works. Um, oh, there's noise. Um, there we go. I'm assuming you can't hear the noise now. Real good. Um, so this is our galaxy, the Milky Way, I might just start it again, given that I was speaking. So this is, I'm sure you've seen our galaxy from the ground. Um, and so at the center of our galaxy here in the constellation Sagittarius is a supermassive black hole. And so this is right, right at the center of our galaxy. And so this is a zoom in on how far at the center of our galaxy this supermassive black hole is. So it's very, very, very small <laughs> in the grand scheme of our galaxy. And so recently in, you know, the last couple of months, we actually were able to observe our supermassive black hole called Sagittarius A star um, for the first time. And so that's um, what this image is here. And so we have a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. Uh, and we've actually found that there is a supermassive black hole at the center of almost every galaxy in the universe. And so we don't know a lot of things about these supermassive black holes. We don't really know where they come from, why they're there. Um, we don't know how they interact with their host galaxies. It's kind of, there's quite a lot of mysteries about them. Um, and one thing that's really interesting though about them is so 
we zoomed in so far, like these black holes are really, really tiny on the grand scheme of our galaxy. They're very small. So these black holes are a million to a billion times the mass of our sun, um, which is phenomenally huge, right? <laughs> but for our galaxy, that's very small. And so these black holes don't really have any impact gravitationally on our galaxy. They affect like the nearest stars um, in the center of the galaxy, but that's kind of it. So weirdly enough though, that these tiny black holes at the center actually have an absolutely phenomenal uh, Maddie, I think we've lost your audio. Impact on the galaxy You're itself. Back. So here is another galaxy, so not our movie. Own. This is um, the galaxy here, the yellow blob at the center. And so you can see these massive jets, these pink jets. And so we see these in radio wavelengths. So you won't see these with your eyes, but we can see these with radio telescopes. And these are caused by very energetic electrons that are being ejected from the galaxy. And so what's actually happening here is this extreme. Um, situation is caused by the supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy. So even though that black hole is super tiny, it's had made such an impact that is actually like much, much bigger than the galaxy itself. And so when something like this is happening, we actually call these active galactic nuclei um, because what's going on is the, the black hole at the center of the galaxy is very active. So active gal galaxy center, basically. And so right at the center, when we've zoomed in that whole way, what's actually going on is there's our supermassive black hole sitting at the center and it has formed an accretion disk around it. So if there's any gas or dust um, or even stars right very, very close to the center of that supermassive black hole, gravitationally what will happen is it will form a disk that rotates around that black hole. Um, and so gravitationally for that to be stable, it needs to rotate very fast because a black hole has a lot of gravity. So the disk spins really fast, fast things um, get hot and hot things radiate energy. And so these disks are actually the brightest objects in the universe. And so even though the black hole itself is black and so we see no light from the black hole these accretion disks can actually outshine all of the stars in the galaxy they're that bright and so when this accretion is happening um the, this is a very active system and so what can happen is the um, black hole can also eject from this disk um, these energetic electrons which is what we saw causing that very large scale um, jet in the, in the previous image. So these are very intense systems. Uh, and so what I'm very interested in is studying what kinds of galaxies these very active black holes live in. And so that's kind of easy in our local universe. And so when I say local universe, I mean a few billion light years away, which probably to you sounds like a very long way away. Um, so these are very local galaxies for me. So here is what one of these um, accretion disks look like. And so that's at the center here. So it is very, very bright source of light. That is that disk. And then you've got the galaxy itself, the really pretty spiral arms in this case with the stars that you can see. And so when we're seeing the disk like this, we call this a quasar, the accretion disk, sorry, not the galaxy disk. This accretion disk, we call this a quasar. And so we can measure very accurately. You can see, you can see that galaxy. You can measure it quite well. You can measure how big it is, how massive it is, what shape it is. You know, these are nice disk spiral galaxies. Um, and you can compare the properties of the black hole to the galaxy. And interestingly, there are actually very tight relationships between the properties of the supermassive black hole and the properties of the galaxy. But I don't really want to go into that. I really want to kind of get into the difficulties of observing these in the early universe, because that's really what Webb is gonna help me do. So yeah, so this is local galaxies. 
what happens is if you look at galaxies further back in time, back distant to us in the universe, they are smaller um, on the sky and both physically and, you know, looking at them. And so it becomes really hard to distinguish the galaxy from the quasar. And so this is the same instrument that I showed here. This is the Hubble Space Telescope, all of these. Um, and so this is a one billion light year away quasar and it's beautiful large galaxy. And this is the ugly blob that we get when it's 10 billion light years away. And so <laughs> I really wanna measure the host galaxies, so the galaxies that these active black holes live in, in the early universe, but you can see it, you can't really see that galaxy anymore. It's not immediately obvious whether it's a nice spiral galaxy or it's, you know, it's hard to tell what we're actually looking at here. But what we can do is we can use very fancy image techniques to model the quasar light and subtract that off. So the quasar always looks the same shape on the sky with a certain telescope. And so this shape um, that a point source, like so either a star or a quasar, some unresolved source will have with a telescope. It's called the point spread function or PSF. And so for Hubble, it looks like an X shape. Uh, it'll be clearer in the next image that I show. And so we can model that X shape, subtract it off, and we see our galaxy. And so we can still do our measurements, which is really helpful. So this technique works, and we can do this subtraction to about 10 billion light years away. Um, but unfortunately, for the very, very first black holes, which we really want to study because it means that we can see why the black holes form in the first place. If we find the first ones, we can, you know, find out a lot about why, why, why they're growing so quickly. Where are they? Where do they live? We do this subtraction and we can't actually see the host galaxy. So this is a really clear image of what the point spread function of, of the, uh, of, um, Hubble, so I'm so used to talking about James Webb this week. <laughs> the Hubble Space Telescope looks like this. It's a, the X shape. And so you subtract off the quasar and there's nothing there. And so we can't see the host galaxy. Now, this black hole definitely lives in a galaxy. I can tell you that for certain. We just can't see it. And so the problem is that we can't distinguish a point source of, for the quasar from a galaxy. The galaxy is too small. And so for Hubble, as our galaxy just looks like a single point of light. So what we need to be able to distinguish the galaxy from the quasar is a better telescope. And luckily we've just got one. Um, and so hopefully the James Webb Space Telescope will be able to actually make that galaxy instead of being the galaxy, just a tiny point of light on the sky, the galaxy will look a bit clearer and um, we'll be able to hopefully, <laughs> tell the difference between the galaxy and the quasar and actually see what galaxies these first supermassive black holes live in. So we will um, have a program with James Webb to observe two of these quasars in the very early universe. Um, and so we're going to take pictures of them with NearCam. And so we really want to find what, these, what galaxies they live in. And so this has never been done before. Um, because of Hubble's the best telescope we've had and that won't work. I just showed you it doesn't work. Um, so we want to find out what galaxies they live in and how do the properties of the galaxy compare to the black hole properties? Um, how do the properties that we can see with Webb compare with other instruments like ALMA, which um, you might know about. And actually um, we can see the gas and the dust in the galaxy, but we can't see the stars. Um, and so that's how I can tell you for sure that the galaxies exist because we can see them through different methods, but we can't see their stars at all until now. Um, and we also want to know where these galaxies live. So are these galaxies that host these supermassive black holes by themselves or maybe more likely, do they have the, lots of neighbours and they're interacting with each other and that's what's causing these supermassive black holes to grow? So that's my research in a very short nutshell. <laughs> so yeah, I hope that gives you some idea of what Wes and I will be doing with the James Webb Space Telescope. So yeah, I guess we can take questions now again, if you have any. Uh, Andrew sent no. a message to me to say that they'll do questions at the end. Sweet.
Sounds good. I just read that then. Yeah. So <laughs> cool. Um, okay. So I think Wes and I decided that we'd split the web images in half. So Wes will go first. Yeah, Would you uh, like me to give an overview of what happened this week, Wes, before you do that? Go okay. for it. Sounds great. Okay. So you, unless you've been living under a rock, which you could have been, you've probably heard about the James Webb Space Telescope, which launched in December after 20 years of anticipation. Um, and it's been in space for the last six months, assembling itself and being commissioned, which involves making sure that the telescope works as well as it, we expected it would. And then after all that, it is now ready for science. And to celebrate that, um, NASA, the Canadian Space Agency and the European Space Agency, the three agencies that um, help build and run web, released some very exciting first images from the web telescope. And so this has been all over the news this week. Um, so I'm sure you've seen them, but if you haven't, we're going to show them to you for the first time. And if you have, we're going to tell you all about them and our opinions. So. Yes, because we all have opinions. <laughs> <laughs> so um, funny enough, I know you said, uh, Madeline said imagery. I'm actually going to start with something that's not an image, but in fact, a spectrum. Just a second here to the sharing this one. So. Um, uh, one of the great surprises, I would I, I would argue one of the greatest surprises of astronomy of the last sort of 30 years is the discovery of uh, hot Jupiters or gas giant planets of a similar mass to Jupiter that are on orbits that are much closer to their parent stars than Mercury is to the sun, which is an astonishing thing. Even now, 30 years later, I still am blown away by the fact that these things even exist. Um, knowing what they are made of has uh, been a long standing question that has been extremely difficult to uh, ask uh, simply because we haven't had the telescopic facilities to do it. And so this was a very short um, experiment or a set of observations performed by the JWST of randomly chosen WASP 96B. Uh, WASP stands uh, is the acronym for the uh, telescope survey that found it. And 96B, I think 96 is some, some star or something like that. I can't really remember uh, what it stands for. It's just another license plate of the thousands of exoplanets we have. And so in that sense, this is kind of typical, uh, which is awesome that it, it's just typical and it was easy. Um, so what we're seeing here is a spectrum of the, a transmission spectrum of the atmosphere. Um, uh, and you see the words H2O water written all over that. Um, this is a, I'll, I'll walk you through all of what this actually means. Um, starting right from the basics, uh, a spectrum uh, is basically a measurement of the distribution of amount of light at different wavelengths or different colors. Um, a lot of you have seen the, uh, the art on uh, a certain Pink Floyd album. Uh, I was thinking about showing that, but I decided to show this pic picture of a spectrum instead. This is, uh, or of a uh, prism instead this is just the sun shining through a glass prism and breaking it up into the rainbow that we've all seen um, another way to look at this uh, and this is getting a little bit closer to the topic at hand is the uh, atmospheric opacity of our atmosphere the thing that keeps us alive and so uh, oh it, the bottom axis there sorry I cut it off it, it's supposed to say wavelength and this shows everything from gamma rays and x-rays on the left which are very short wavelengths, very, very short wavelengths to very long wavelengths, the radio on the right um, and the communication things that happen in between of the radio. Uh, Alma that was mentioned earlier uh, sits in the um, uh, infrared range, the what we call the submillimeter range where the wavelengths are uh, a, you know, uh, just, just shy of a, a millimeter down to a, 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 you know, a quarter of a millimeter, something like that. And you have this little gap in the opacity. And so, uh, just to describe this, where the bands are yellow, it means the atmosphere absorbs all of the energy in that spectrum. And so fortunately, things like X-rays and gamma rays are absorbed by the top of the atmosphere, and so we aren't cooked to death. Um, and then there is the optical bands that we, our eyes have evolved to understand and, and interpret. Um, and then JWST uh, absorb, observes uh, a little bit longer than the optical band in what we call the near infrared, where you see a lot of the yellow creeping up again. Those yellow fingers that occur are 
mostly due to water absorption in the upper atmosphere. Um, and so it's kind of great that the first spectrum they showed is of the same thing that we are protected by here on the earth. It is of water. And so uh, this is near spec. I just wanted to give a, a scale of just how amazing the engineering is that went into this particular uh, uh, telescope, this facility. This is just one of the cameras. And so the light enters uh, a sort of top middle and goes down to the bottom right and then bounces through a bunch of mirrors that do a bunch of focusing. There is in the middle here in blue, a, uh, a mirror array that has basically a bunch of individual holes in it that each one is a little mirror that we can activate to open up and let light through on a particular spot. And so we can actually take pictures of spectra of each individual mirror through a whole field of view, which is not something we've really been able to do before, especially not in space. And then it goes through a fancy spectrograph, which is all the bouncing back and forth there through filters and, and uh, grisms in, uh, or you know, basically plates of lines instead of a prism. But it produces a measurement in the same sort of way that the, this spectrum here looks like. And so we're basically just breaking up the light of a source into its component wavelengths and asking the question, how bright are all those different wavelengths? Now, it gets a little bit more complex because this is a, an exoplanet, which is totally dwarfed in brightness by the star it orbits. And so what they actually did was to take a spectrum of the star when the planet is away from the star, and then they took another spectrum when the planet is in front and absorbing a little bit of the starlight. And then you subtract the two and you get a spectrum left over. Um, this has been done before. Uh, one or two measurements have been done from the ground. Uh, a number have been done from HST. But even with HST, the, the, the best we have costs you know, tens to hundreds of hours of time, uh, which is needless to say, a very, very expensive thing to do just to get one measurement where this has been, this was done in minutes. <laughs> like if, that's just to give you a, a scale of just how much better JWST is even over the veritable uh, HST. And here is the result. Um, and so you can see the, the, you know, the, the, the data points here, each one of those bands has a, 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 an error bar on it or a vertical line. And that gives you an idea of how certain or uncertain each one of those points is. And there's a lot of structure in here that is not accounted for by uh, an atmosphere that is basically just water vapor, but they haven't really haven't had time to do any real science on this yet. And so uh, the blue line is an approximation of what they'll really get out of it. But the main thing to take away from the spectrum is that each one of those peaks is due to water, but unlike uh, in our relatively cold atmosphere, which is absorbing, this is actually an emission. And so from this, they now know that the atmosphere temperature on average is about 790 degrees Celsius, uh, which I was blown away by that number. Uh, the fact that water even exists in this atmosphere is an amazing thing. I figured it would have been torn apart by its own temperature. Um, and so like, you know, 15 or 20 minutes of observing or some number like that, and we get the best atmospheric spectrum, a transmission spectrum of a hot Jupiter or any exoplanet ever required. Uh, that really kind of poked me in the eye. <laughs> it was amazing. Um, since we're not going to do questions until the end, I'm going to move on to the next one. I know we don't want to take up your whole time tonight. Um, this is now moving out. Uh, so this is the Carina Nebula. Anyone that's been to the southern sky and stared up at night, you can actually see this thing with your eye. Uh, of course, doesn't look like this picture up on the top left. Um, there is a sub, uh, another smaller nebula in the top right there, NGC 3324, which is one of the JWST early targets. Um, you can sort of get a, a progressive zoom in. This was, Madeline found this on Twitter, and so it's a fantastic perspective. Uh, the box on the top right, or the, the, the picture on the top right, shows a zoom in of the nebula that you get in the tiny little box in the top left. And then finally, um, the little rectangular cutout in the bottom left shows you where JWST looked. Um, this is what we call a star forming region, and all of this structure is the, uh, the, the, basically the dust that we're seeing most well actually in these these pictures are most of it's actually just reflective light um, but the JWST sees the dust and the reason why this is so chaotic is because you have tens or hundreds of stars forming all together and some of them ignite and they produce great sudden swarms of energy that push out these bubbles and so this is the uh, th NGC 3324 is actually just a star forming bubble just um, 
And man, man, oh man, is this a, a spectacular photo. So this is now that same photo frame turned on its side so you can get a little bit more detail. Um, and what you see here is a wall of dust that is basically a pressure bubble with stars forming to the top of the screen, producing a lot of energy uh, and blowing this bubble along. And so if you were to go look at this a thousand years from now, that wall will have actually moved, which I find an absolutely amazing thing. Um, and there is more structure in here than uh, we could talk about in an hour. There's all kinds of stuff going on. Um, this is uh, with NearCam, uh, which is one of the cameras, the same camera that I, uh, or no, not the same camera, but one of the cameras that we've uh, got some pictures from. There's also MIRI, which is uh, observing at longer wavelengths. And so NearCam can get you hot dust and MIRI can get you cold dust. And when you merge the two together, you can produce uh, just totally fantastic images like this. Um, there is that uh, uh, same wall, this is zoomed in a little further still. All of these big bright blue and yellow things are stars that are most of which are forming within this region, um, or at least the, the yellow ones are. Um, a couple of things I really wanna point out here. Um, you go back to this picture here and you zoom in the bottom there, the bottom left. You can see a bunch of foreground stars, but you don't really see any specks of light within the, the gas and dust itself. And that's because at optical wavelengths, dust basically cuts everything out and you can't penetrate through it. Go down to here and you go straight through for the most part, uh, which is totally amazing. Um, one of the things that really caught my eye though is this clump of black on the bottom right or nearly bottom right that is fully opaque. The, that, that stuff is really, really thick and really, really cold dust. And I'm willing to bet that if we were to point a radio telescope at it, we would find a very, very young stellar source that is in the process of growing right now. Um, I would have expected all of this stuff to be fully transparent to JWST by now. And well, uh, expectations are naive, I guess. Um, one of the other things I absolutely love, if you look um, sort of nine o'clock, well, most, I wish I could actually isolate this, the, the nine o'clock in the middle, sort of directly below the little A of Car the last day of Karina, there is a red star. That is a very, very energetic young star, very hot. And off of it, you see these two wings. They almost look like the, you know, the Star Trek insignia turned on its side. Uh, that's outflow. Uh, and so the birth of a star is actually a very violent process. And this is a great example of that. We're finally getting really high resolution pictures of this process. Um, and the, the bands that you see are, you know, you get an outflow that occurs and then there's a pressure blast from other nearby forming stars that, that push that material away. And this is why you get these two fingers that flow off. What confuses me is they're completely different direction than the, the pressure wall, right? This, this wall exists because there's a lot of radiation pressure pushing the gas to, or the dust downwards and yet you've got this star being blown completely perpendicular to it. Uh, I have no idea what the physics is that allows that to happen uh, and so this is again very early days for I think what is probably the best, most to me the most exciting picture of the last 10 years of astronomy uh, and I one more to talk about I'll go pretty quickly here this is beyond my my expertise so forgive me if I sound kind of stupid uh, the Southern Ring Nebula is a planetary nebula, again, in the south. The south always seems to have all the exciting stuff. Um, and in the optical, you can see a nebula like this uh, that, you know, it's basically just a, a, a round puffed shell. Uh, and what happens at the late stages of a star like our sun, it will puff off a lot of material before it finally blows up, leaving a white dwarf behind. The puffed off material is what produces the nebula and the glow is produced by the radiation from the white dwarf. Uh, uh, for those who don't know, the white dwarf itself is essentially the interior core of a star. And so when it's exposed, you're, you're talking about temperatures of like 50 to 150,000 Kelvin. They do the hottest, basically some of the hottest things in the universe. And so they produce a lot of ultraviolet radiation which allow these nebula to glow spectacularly. Um, We've never been able to see the white dwarf at the center of this particular nebula because it happens to be enshrouded by a great deal of dust that itself produced. Um, but finally, if you go to the, the, the longest wavelengths that JWST kind of picks up with uh, Miri here, I guess not quite the longest, but some of the longer ones, um, you can see that red source sitting there in the middle, which you can't see in the left one. And so this gives you an idea of what longer wavelengths get you. Um, 
the, the dust completely enshrouds the, the white dwarf and we still don't actually see it, but we see the dust itself glowing. And so this is some of the benefit that the JWST provides us. We finally know where the source of all this energy actually is. And there's all kinds of other things I could talk about here, but uh, I'll let Madeline do some rambling now. <laughs> yeah, okay, sounds good. Yeah, both Wes and I, we're not sure who should take that one because neither of us were <laughs> experts at all. But anyway, <laughs> so I have picked the two that I know most about. So hopefully I can talk a little bit about them. Um, so the first is the Galaxy Cluster. The actual gory details are here if you care about these such things. Um, and so this was the first image that we saw from Webb. So this was released by Joe Biden on Monday. Um, and so this was our first sneak peek at what Webb would look like. Um, and so I'm sure you've seen this by now. Um, and so what this is, is a galaxy cluster. So generally what we're seeing, so this white, kind of this big white area here with these big white kind of galaxies is a cluster of galaxies kind of in our local universe, for me, very nearby, for where's very far away. Um, <laughs> but so what's happening though is these galaxies um, in the foreground are actually gravitationally lensing the galaxies that are behind it. So what's happening is instead of the light from this galaxy, with this you know stretchy galaxy here, being able to pass directly from the galaxy to us, this galaxy is in the way. But because of Einstein's theory of general relativity, what that means is the mass of this galaxy cluster, this group of galaxies here, actually warps space-time. And so instead of the light traveling directly, well, it is traveling directly in a line from us to them, but that line is actually curved around the galaxy cluster. And so this gravitational lensing is great for studying things in the very early universe because it's actually like a big magnifying glass. So you can see things that were fainter than you would have otherwise been able to see. And so one other thing that this lensing does is actually makes your galaxies look pretty wacky. So not all of them. So some galaxies can be lensed and just look normal, but a bit brighter than before. But if they line up just right with the gravity of the situation, um, they can be lensed in these what we call arcs. And so zooming in a little bit further, you can see some more of the details in this picture. So you can see these, these galaxies are normal kind of spherical looking things, but the gravity has stretched them so that, sorry, the gravity in the galaxy itself has not stretched them, but the gravity um, has stretched the light as it passes on its way to us to stretch what the galaxy appears to look like on the sky, if that makes any kind of sense. Um, <laughs> so yeah, these galaxies are normal shaped, but because of lensing, they look like um, arcs. And so because of this magnifying, we can see lots of very distant things that we might not otherwise be able to. And also, you know, these really cool structures. And so, I mean, you could just spend an hour, and I think I did on Monday, just looking at these images. It's just amazing how many little galaxies you see when you zoom in, all of the different shapes and colors and sizes. It's really crazy. And so the majority of these galaxies are billions of years old. Um, and so some of them are, and one of them in particular has been measured to be 13.1 billion years old. So if we zoom in a little bit further, on this guy here, so this red dot, as inconspicuous as it may look, is actually a galaxy 13.1 billion light years away. And so the reason that we know that is because of Webb's capabilities. So as well as being able to take images of this galaxy cluster, it also took spectroscopy, as was explained, in lots of different modes. So there are four instruments on Webb and all of them can do some kind of spectroscopy. And so this was really kind of a demonstration of how Webb can do all sorts of different things. So what this shows is the elemental abundances of this galaxy. And so these elements um, 
always have these emission features at a specific fixed wavelength in their rest frame space. So hydrogen will always you know, vibrate at a certain frequency. And so based on this pattern, so specifically this one that's most obvious to me is you've got one hydrogen line and then two oxygen lines. From that pattern, there are only those three lines that make that pattern. And so from that, you can actually tell how redshifted the galaxy is. So these are generally, um, I don't know what they are. Actually, I wrote it. So this line here happens at 0.48 microns, if that's something that you care about, um, in its observed frame. But you can see we've actually measured it at 4.6 microns. And so what's happened is this galaxy is at redshift eight and a half. So it's 13.1 billion years old. So by measuring the spectra and finding those template lines and seeing, okay, we've got this pattern. We know that that must be hydrogen and oxygen. We know what wavelength that actually happens at. We can measure what wavelength it is. And therefore we know how distant that galaxy is, if that makes sense. And so as well as finding the distance to galaxies in this image, we can also work out what they're made from. So you can see, you know, it's got some neon and oxygen and obviously lots of hydrogen. And so you can work out the star formation rates, how quickly these galaxies are forming stars and stuff like that. So that's one um, thing that, um, that I wanted to talk about for the cluster. The other thing is you may have seen some images comparing Hubble and Webb floating around. And so this is the same cluster. So on the left is Hubble's best image kind of of this cluster. And on the right is what we can see with Webb. So you can see the absolutely massive difference. But I don't think that this picture really does Hubble justice. I think we're kind of putting Hubble down a little bit. This is not the best image of a cluster Webb uh, Hubble ever took. I would argue that maybe it's this one. And so you can see Hubble can really do great things, um, but Webb can do them better. So this image here was really just a test run. It was quoted as being the deepest view of the infrared universe so far, but that record will probably last a week, if maybe not even a week. Um, so many observations will be taken with Webb and this was just, this was 12 and a half hours of time with Webb and some people are observing parts of the universe for you know, maybe a hundred hours. <laughs> so yeah, so Webb is awesome. Don't get me wrong, but if you saw this, Maybe you know, Hubble's capable of great things and we shouldn't, you know, put it down too much. But Webb's awesome, way better than Hubble. Okay, so the last of the five targets that was released on Tuesday was Stefan's Quintet. And I think this is my favorite. So this is a system of four interacting galaxies. So we've got one, two, three, four. And this guy who is actually really close to us in comparison. So it looks like they're together on the sky, but it's much closer in front. Uh, but these four are actually interacting with each other. And so this one's really cool because you can see the gas between the galaxies. So these galaxies are colliding with each other and heating up all of this gas, which you can see in the red, these dust lanes. And I mean, I don't really want to point out too much in these images. I think it's just amazing how beautiful they are. I don't even think we need to do science with these to, for these to be awesome images, right? Like we can just appreciate them for what they look like. So this is a combination of both Neocam and Miri images. Um, and so I also wanted to show you just with Neocam. So this is in the near infrared, whereas Miri is in the mid infrared, hence the M. Um, and so if you go back and forth between the two, you can see that Miri, which is looking at redder wavelengths, sees more of the dusty part of the galaxy. So if we go back and forwards again, so if you see this dust lane is kind of not as obvious in near cam. And then all of the, well, all of the dust in this galaxy really, really shows up as well in, in the Miri. So if we just look at Miri on its own without the near cam, this is what we see. And so really we're looking at just the, more like the, the gas and the dust in the galaxies here. Um, and the thing that I like the most is this spiky thing here. 
which is a supermassive black hole at the center of the topmost galaxy. And so likely because these galaxies are interacting with each other, it's triggered a burst of um, black hole accretion, just like I talked about, and that is shining like a quasar. And so we can see that in the mid infrared really nice and clearly. So I wrote the stats down, so I remembered. So that supermassive black hole is 24 million times the mass of our sun and radiates at 40 billion times how, as the brightness of our sun. So yeah, that was a cool little Easter egg. I knew that we were getting an image of Stefan's quintet, but I did not know that there was a supermassive black hole there that we'd be seeing. So that was really cool. Um, I think I have one more. Yeah, here we go. So this is what it looked like with Hubble. And here is what it looks like with Webb. So again, Hubble's not shabby. Hubble is fantastic, but I think Webb's definitely going to uh, <laughs> uncover some pretty cool things because this is just really beautiful. And I think one thing that's very obvious to a lot of people studying the very early universe and galaxies in particular is how many things are in the background. So you see in the, in the Hubble image, you've got black darkness in between some of these galaxies here, but even in this kind of short image with Webb, there is, this, we're running out of darkness, really. Like there's a galaxy almost everywhere you look. And so there's so much data for us to start to analyze. And there's going to be really exciting. So this is really just a first look at Webb. So overall, it was about 100 hours of Webb observations that went into um, the images that were released this week. And so really, we've got 10 years of, of web data to look forward to. So this was just showing what web's capable of um, in a very small amount of time. So yeah, I think we've got a very exciting decade ahead in terms of beautiful pictures that we'll be able to see with the web. That's it. So I don't know if maybe I'll leave my screen up so when people ask questions, we can refer to that. I do have the pictures of the other objects too, Wes, so I could probably just keep that up. Anyone have any questions? Does this work? Sure. Yep. Some feedback, oh, yep. Amazing. That has a little bit of feedback. That's okay, I'll leave. Uh, we'll take the questions uh, both on chat and in the room here. Um, there, I saw one question earlier on in the chat um, from Jazz asking, are the jets always ejected parallel to the axis of rotation of the accretion disk? Um, I actually don't think they always are. I think there can be a little bit of an offset. I, I um, think that's true. I think it's a combination of the angular momentum as well as the, the magnetic field that's produced by the star. But again, that's that's not really my realm of uh, yeah. expertise. Yeah, I care more about the galaxies than the black holes themselves. <laughs> but I have a feeling it can be yeah, affected by other things. And actually, sometimes you can see the jet is not symmetric. So instead of having two lobes that are opposite each other, they might have some kind of angle between them because, yeah, I think it is the magnetic field that, that makes it do that. Yeah. But generally, they're kind of opposite each other. You don't really have like two that are on one side. It's, and I think usually there are two. I think in some cases there may be one, but yeah, it gets pretty funky. Yeah. <laughs> and it's hard to tell, like, if it's just because we're observing it, like, can we not see the other one or, yeah, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then we've got a question here at SFU, if you want to take it away. Hi. Uh, no, I've got a question about the shapes, like, how long do the electrons stay energetic enough to be seen by radio? Um, a very long time, I think, like thousands of years. Yeah, so at what speed are they moving? Like very, very close to the speed of light. They're relativistic jets. Yeah. yeah. They're just covering a very large distance. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. These are huge systems. So even though they're traveling at the speed of light, they still don't get too far. <laughs> yeah. And so actually some an interesting thing is there have been jets that 
you get multiple jets. So the, the black hole isn't always growing and always producing a jet. And so what can happen is there'll be a burst of activity, there'll be a jet, and then it will stop. And then a while later, you'll get another burst and there'll be another jet. And so you'll see a jet pair where one jet's bigger than the other because it's just had longer to get out more, if that makes sense. Yeah. Which, yeah, they're pretty cool. And so you can actually do all sorts of things about the timing. So you can work out when the black hole must have been growing based on how big the jet is and the speed of light. So, yeah, you can do lots of physics with the jets. Thank you. Thank you. And then a question from the chat from Douglas. Uh, will your research on early black holes tell you anything about how galaxies form? Um, it's a good question. I guess really the thing that we care most about in terms of our research is how do the galaxies form with respect to their black holes? So do, does one form, do we get a galaxy grow quite big first and then our black hole kind of eventually catches up or do we have a massive black hole and the galaxy forms around it? Do they interact a lot? And you know, are, these, are there feedback effects where the black hole will stunt the galaxy's growth? So, and because every galaxy has a supermassive black hole, I guess you can't really think about galaxy growth in a complete way without thinking about how do the black holes actually affect that galaxy. So yeah, I guess our project will really help understand the whole of how galaxies grow because that black hole is such a fundamental part of, of how that process works. Uh, Chris asks, uh, Maddie, is the near spec data for Stefan's Quintet showing us the accretion disk around the black hole? Yeah, so actually I do have a little bit more data here. Yeah, so for the Stefan's Quintet, they actually um, decided to showcase some more of the spectroscopic capabilities. And so they did what's called integral field spectroscopy, or IFU, of the black hole and the, the accretion disk. Um, and so what that is, um, is... It's basically spatially resolved spectra. So instead of getting one spectra for the object, um, you get a spectra at every 2D pixel. And so what we can do here, so we've got this 2D image and we've got a spectrum at each location. And so we can take the spectrum in this circle and we see this and we take the spectrum at the right at the center of the black hole, well, the accretion disk kind of system and we get a different spectrum because this time we're kind of looking at the disc and this we're really looking at the galaxy and the gas in flowing onto the, the quasar itself. So I haven't really looked at the data and well, any closer than this. Hmm. Um, so I, I'd really like to know, and I'm, I really hope they release like scientific papers about what they've done and, and how, because it's very related to my work. So I'd really like to know what they did um, to get these, you know, these beautiful spectra and stuff. But yeah, yeah, they actually studied the black hole in quite a, a lot of detail. So I'm hoping that some scientists study that pretty soon and let me know what they found. Yeah. <laughs> um, anybody else have any questions either uh, in person here at SFU uh, or in the chat, you can toss them into the... Uh, in the chat. Oh, uh, Douglas again. Uh, how will you use data about Kuiper Belt objects? And I assume this is directed at US. Yeah, um, actually many different ways. Um, so the the simplest thing uh, what, which, which I presented is, is literally just the size distribution or the count of number of objects as a function of size. And so on the ground, we can observe count how many uh, objects are, you know, greater than say 25th magnitude or 26th magnitude. And then we can extend that in uh, with, with space observations. And we just produce this, that, that, that curve that I was showing. Um, and that provides a sort of goalpost, if you want to think of it that way, for uh, accretion and planet growth simulations to reach. And so you'll, you'll write down your theory and you'll write a computer simulation of that theory and match, uh, try to match as best you can the number of objects as a function of size that we observe with uh, JWST. 
And so that is one of the best ways that we can constrain early planet formation, because we see that the Kuiper belt was in, in, the, in the process of forming planets when that all got turned off. And so we can use that as a sort of a middle state to say, okay, let's grow our, in our simulations and grow planets for a little while and see what comes out the other end. Um, but we're also going to be, uh, you know, one of the things I didn't even talk about at all is the fantastic resolution of JWST. Um, I expect a, a few of these objects to be detected as uh, binary systems. And the, the masses and orbits of those binaries are very, very useful uh, as well for constraining planet formation, because as you saw in one of those animations, we do naturally produce binaries in some mechanism, some ways of growing planetesimals. And so the number of binaries and the properties of the binaries themselves will be very informative as to deciding which different planet formation theories might be viable. Then finally, because we have multiple, multiple wavelengths being observed by the JWST and the multiple wavelengths being observed by the Hubble Space Telescope at the same time, we're also going to get some compositional information, much like what Maddie was showing with the spectra. Um, we can use the, the sort of the broadband colors of Kuiper Belt objects to infer their organic and icy compositions to some extent. And so, uh, those are just the few things off of the top that we're going to we're, we're going to try to trace down with this stuff. But then there's going to be lots of other things that, that come out, like the orbit, the helios, you know, the solar-based uh, orbits that we find these things on. That is very informative for understanding the dynamical history of the entire solar system. And so there's all kinds of different things we're going to do uh, with these data. Uh, I'll. Sorry, I'll uh, I'll do this as a last call for questions uh, in the chat or in person. If you if you want to come up, you can yeah, because the mic is up here. Um, but if you have any last questions here in chat, feel free to to dump those in here. Uh, in the interim, uh, you've got a question. Hello, Wes. Thank you. Um, I have a question regarding the comparison between the two models for transformation. Oh, sure. One is how binary is this theory? Uh, like uh, is either one on the other or can be kind of a combination between both? It, you, you've hit on the right thing, uh, you know, for presentation purposes, uh, those are the, the two sort of extremes of the models. Um, there's actually a lot of variations within, um, and I kind of hinted at that a little bit with that, that model size distribution plot I showed where there are actually three separate models on it. Um, there are many ways uh, in which, um, planets can grow you can come up with many different scenarios you know like i, I showed bugs uh, collecting on windscreens maybe in fact it's actually you know cars bumping together or bugs bumping together as a, a variation on a theme um, but as it turns out uh, by luck jwst is going to be probing the sizes at which those two sorts of models dramatically diverge and so if we were to uh, expect um, the sort of gravitational collapse as a, an answer, we will sort of start to run out of objects around that size. There won't be that many, you know, mini Aircoths, for example. But if uh, really it is bugs growing on a screen, we should actually observe sort of 70 or 80 Kuiper Belt objects. And it's very difficult to take the variations of all of those different simulations and produce something in the middle. That's actually not, that we don't expect that to happen. Um, and so it wouldn't it be amazing, of course, if we did see something like that. Um, and so while the while you're absolutely correct that there are all kinds of different planet formation models and histories and such, the end results are actually kind of binary in that sense. And so um, the details will come out with a lot of extra work, but to know if it's mainly gravitational collapse versus mainly hierarchical growth, I think we'll actually know that pretty quickly, which is awesome. Thank you. And uh, if there's no other questions, uh, I just, I always like to be selfish with the end. I'm the one at the lectern. Uh, and I just want to know just from each of you, both uh, Madeline and Wes, uh, what is the one thing, what is the one kind of answer to the question that's burning in you right now that you want or you hope that Webb will uh, uncover? The one thing, that's a hard question. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Mine's probably pretty basic in that. The galaxies that I care about, we actually haven't seen them ever. I mean, so we see them in Alma, like we see their gas and the dust, but we've never seen the stars before. 
And so even if we don't find anything physical about them, if I could see those stars, I'd be so happy. Like, you know, people have spent decades trying to work out how to do this and it's not possible. So even if I don't get any science done, if I see the stars in a galaxy that host that supermassive black hole that I care about, I'll be very, very happy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> It's hard to not uh, uh, see the forest for the trees when you're, you know, deep in your own research. Um, one of the things that excites me out beyond my own uh, research, I mean, obviously it would be amazing to see an exoplanet. Obviously it would be amazing to see the accretion disks around these black holes, even, even close ones. Obviously it would be amazing to see all kinds of different things. One of the things that has been theorized for years and years and years that we've never seen before are the so-called first stars. Mm -hmm. um, and these are, well, if, if they're real, if they really did exist, they will be a, a mess of giants. You know, these are, these are stars that are supposed to be a couple hundred or maybe a few hundred times the mass of our sun, uh, extremely short lived to call them stars might be a challenge because their lifetimes are shorter than uh, how quickly they can accrete upon themselves. And in at least according to some theories. And so there are they're the first sort of non hydrogen material really that we get in the in the universe and they're extremely important uh, for the building blocks of basically everything. <laughs> We've never seen them before. And if they if they ever existed, JWST may see them, and that would be that would rock my boat for sure. Yeah. Based on your answer, I'm going to add another answer, which is not how this works, but I'm going to make it that way. <laughs> um, in terms of things that are not my research that I'm excited about, I think one of the really cool things that Web will be able to do is find very promising signs of life on other planets. I think that that will be a huge discovery if that's something that we could do. And I think web will be the instrument that we need to kind of make the next step in trying to understand other planets and see if there are habitable planets other than the earth. So I think that'll be some really cool science to look out for is, is whether we can find some atmospheres that look like our atmospheres or not. So, yeah. I think that I think that would be really cool. Yes, agreed, very much so. If you if you want to ask what is the going to be the most scientifically controversial result of JWST, that's probably going to be it. Yeah. <laughs>